Welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Korver. Today, we are joined by Samuel Fleischacker. Samuel Fleischacker is a distinguished professor in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is the author of many books, including On Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, A Philosophical Companion, Divine Teaching and the Way of the World, A Defense of Revealed Religion, The Good and the Good Book, Revelation as a Guide to Life, Being Me, Being You, Adam Smith and Empathy, and most recently, Adam Smith. In today's conversation, we'll focus on this book, What is Enlightenment? I hope you enjoyed the episode. Professor Fleischacker, welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you so much. So, you know, today we're going to focus on the big question, what is uh, enlightenment? Uh, so first off, like, how did you get interested uh, in this, you know, important uh, question uh, about what is enlightenment? And then maybe also how did this ultimately lead you to write a book about this question? So this is a, one of my books for which there's a kind of a funny story. Um, unlike almost everything else I've written, I didn't come up with the idea myself. An editor from Routledge came to me and actually they came to me one year and said, this, this guy had an idea for a set of books, one on each of the four famous questions that you have in the critique of pure reason plus the anthropology, what can we know, what should we do, what may we hope for, and then the additional one that you get elsewhere, what is the human being, right? And would I like to write one of those books? And I thought, you know, this is a very creative idea for a book series, but no, I have other things I need to do. And it, it just, I didn't feel like I wanted to throw myself that much into a Kant book at the time. So he comes back a year later and he says, you know, we're thinking of adding a fifth question. What is enlightenment? It's of course, another Kantian uh, question, even if he doesn't list it as one of the initial ones. And since I had worked on the enlightenment in various forms. You know, I write about Adam Smith, I write about Kant, I write about Hume somewhat. Um, and I've always been very interested in the Enlightenment. I think maybe originally I, I wrote a dissertation about uh, the notion of culture and the degree to which Enlightenment moral theories don't take culture seriously enough, a kind of Alistair McIntyre kind of project, but I was always more favorable to the Enlightenment than McIntyre was. I share some of his suspicions about it, but I also thought he, he has too thin a reading of the Enlightenment. So I've been fascinated by the Enlightenment for my whole career. And I thought by writing a book on Kant's question, what is enlightenment, I could get into some of these issues that interest me. So that time I said, that actually sounds great. Um, and they, the series, you, as, you, as you probably know, they do now have at least three, maybe all four of the other books out. Andrew Chignell is supposed to write what may we hope for. I'm not sure that has come out yet. Um, but the, as, as the editor said to me, it described it to me, the project was to say what Kant, how Kant answers his own question, then what other people have said about the question over the years since Kant, and finally, what I think about the question. And I thought that sounded like a very nice um, structure. And as you know, that's how my book is structured. I first deal with Kant's own essays and not just the What is Enlightenment essay. And I should say, by the way, I'm particularly honored to be on a, a series called Dare to Know, which of course comes right out of what is enlightenment. Um, but then afterwards, I talk about reactions to Kant, extensions of Kant, and, uh, and finally, I lay out my own defense of one strand of Kant's thinking on this. So it worked out to be a very nice project, but it wasn't originally one that I thought of. It was sort of put in my mind by, uh, by someone else. Oh, that, that's great. And, and, and so, you know, when people maybe think uh, about enlightenment, right, like many people might be thinking about the period, like the enlightenment, or I think now many uh, historians actually uh, prefer to talk about enlightenments, uh, a different strength within enlightenment, moderate enlightenment, pragmatist enlightenment, uh, radical enlightenment. So lots of uh, versions of enlightenment uh, going around, uh, uh, I suppose. But in the beginning, you make clear, right? It's not just about the period enlightenment. There's also the process enlightenment, right? And so could you maybe just briefly touch upon what is this distinction? Obviously, there's the period, but what about the process of enlightenment? Sure. And uh, of course, both notions are contested. And uh, as you indicated, the historical period, whether we should talk about the enlightenment or various kinds of enlightenments, and then depending upon which enlightenment you're talking about, how you would date them. I believe Hegel may be the first to label the period Aufklärung, the Enlightenment. Um, even in Kant's time, Kant talks about a process of enlightenment, but doesn't quite 
in fact, he says, do, I live, do we live in an enlightened age? No, but we live in an age of enlightenment, meaning in his case that we're not enlightened yet, but we're on our way, as it were. Um, look, to think, one way to think about the distinction quite clearly, I think, is to recognize, um, as many people reminded me when I first said, told people about this project, that enlightenment is also used in many other traditions for something quite different from what the 18th century thought of as enlightenment or what anybody in the 18th century who described themselves as enlightened would, would say. Think of it, for instance, in the Buddhist tradition, achieving enlightenment, there's certainly a very important notion. Uh, and there is an idea that you move out of a stage of confusion and illusion into a state of a place of light and you realize what your errors were before, uh, but in a very different sense than the rationalist, secular, liberal kind of program that we identify with the, with the enlightenment or even the enlightenment in the plural. Um, and then one could talk about coming to enlightenment in other uh, traditions. Neoplatonism has some notion of coming into enlightenment. Certainly there are various kinds of religious traditions in which there's an idea that once you realize your previous errors, you come out of those errors, you come into a state of enlightenment. And of course, those have nothing to do with what the enlightenment or even the enlightenments we're talking about. The confusion can arise because the period we call the, we used to call the Enlightenment, roughly the 18th century, or some people would begin in the 1680s or something like that around Locke, and maybe end with the French Revolution, sometimes a little bit later, is a period in which people thought they were going through the process of enlightenment, or, le or they were the leaders of a process of enlightenment. And even then, there's a cluster of things that that process might consist in, might consist in becoming uh, better versed in science and, and improving and, and extending um, a scientific approach to the natural world as a very important part of what's called the Enlightenment. It might include, uh, it might consist in uh, developing a more liberal political world, uh, moving towards what we would today call liberal democracy, what they would, might call republicanism. It might consist in ceasing to be religious or being religious in a more tolerant and open, uh, uh, open-minded way. All of those things factor into what the people in the Enlightenment thought of as the process of Enlightenment. But what they tended to agree on is that they lived in an age in which those processes were either coming into their own for the first time or certainly increasing much more than they ever had before. Um, so there's an overlap between what they thought of as the process and their own period, but um, the period needn't, the process can take place in other ways in other periods and the period might or might not in fact have realized the dreams that they that they had for themselves so i hope that clarifies the distinction somewhat yeah certainly and then so when we continue on that point about sort of thinking about the process of enlightenment right so maybe just as a as a first sort of take right how should we start thinking about how kant uh, tackles that specific question if i heard you you already mentioned uh, right like there's several definitions at play you know right. in those times trying to define what the process of, of uh, enlightenment amounts to and i think one hint at least seems to be uh, something you mentioned in the book, which is that Kant thinks it's a practical task and not necessarily a theoretical task, but maybe you could just uh, elaborate, right? Uh, just a, sort of a starting point, how we should think about this. Right. Well, let's bear in mind that other people who even answered the uh, Berliner Monatschrift's call for answers to the question, what is enlightenment? Some of them took it to be engaging in rational theology natural theology. Uh, many of the people we now call enlighteners in Scotland were very concerned with practical in, uh, information that would help you improve agriculture, for instance. And they by no means meant to upset traditional notions of religion. Um, others would say at the time, Hume certainly, that Basically, unless we get rid of superstition and enthusiasm, uh, we're not enlightened. That's what enlightenment consists in, uh, to the extent that he answered that question. He certainly seemed to think that becoming more rationalistic about religion, not necessarily giving it up altogether, but certainly he, 
whether he was an atheist or an agnostic is a little bit contested, but coming out of traditional beliefs in God and religion was important to him, a, a, a process that he thought we all needed to undergo. What's exciting about Kant, you might have thought he would give any of those kinds of answers, that he would locate uh, enlightenment in some kind of intellectual achievement, perhaps very much moving from uh, traditional to a rationalist theology, uh, expanding our scientific knowledge and using it in more practical ways. Instead of saying any of those things, he begins his famous essay, What is Enlightenment?, by saying it's simply a matter of daring to think for yourself, daring to know, but in the sense of thinking for yourself. And that makes it sound like, first of all, something anybody can do, and everybody should do, and anybody can do. Secondly, a condition or process that requires courage more than anything else. And indeed, he does present it as a matter of courage, a matter of getting over fears we have of contradicting the authorities around us and of, um, as he says, overcoming a kind of laziness, um, a matter of the energy to think, work things out for oneself rather than just passively accepting what we read in books. Um, and there's something wonderfully egalitarian about that. It also, there's maybe unusually a, a, a sort of humility in this great philosopher not saying you have to become a philosopher, right? Um, also not saying you have to agree with him about religion or politics or anything else. All you have to do is you yourself need to start thinking for yourself. So I think that's a, there's a reason why this essay is very famous. And I think at least part of it is that it seems to be exciting and inviting in a way that other conceptions of enlightenment at the time were not. Mm -hmm. and, and then maybe moving to um, one of the crucial distinctions he makes within uh, uh, this essay, right, which is the distinction between private and public uh, use of reason. Um, so how can we sort of unpack this distinction and what can this actually do for us? Okay, so that's an important question, especially because Kant's use of those terms can be very confusing at first. Kant tells us that the private use of reason can be restrained legitimately in some circumstances, while the public use of reason must always be free. And at first sight or first hearing, um, certainly anyone who knows the um, Anglo-British tradition of freedom of expression, I assume this is true for anyone who talks about freedom of expression, that my first thought must be with he's got it exactly backwards. Right In my public capacity as a representative of the university or a senator or representative of the government or representative maybe of a religious or cultural group, then I could have some restrictions on what I have to say. Maybe whoever I work for, who I represent, legitimately can expect of me that I won't say certain things because I, I have a certain role to fulfill. In my private capacity, I should be completely free. That's the, the capacity in which I should speak freely. So one answer to that puzzlement is simply Kant uses the terms in exactly the reverse way. Uh, but actually it's more interesting that, than that because what Kant thinks is that insofar as I have any specific role in a governmental position as a representative of a group um, or even really sometimes as a parent or, or, or if I'm just representing some aspect of myself in business or whatever, um, that's, I'm, de I'm deprived in some ways. He, he thinks of the, uh, of the root of private in the Latin privatus, which means to be deprived in some ways, limited in some ways. So when I'm speaking for the university or for my ethnic or religious group or as a political official, I am deprived. What am I deprived of? I'm deprived of my full humanity. It, I'm not speaking simply as a human being. I'm speaking as an American university professor or as a Jew or as a... Uh, a member of a certain club, let's say. Um, and then, yes, my role can be uh, limited. And because my role is limited, my speech can also be limited legitimately in some ways. When I speak just as one human being to another, then I am properly speaking in my public capacity. And that's really rather interesting because it shows that Kant's conception of 
public reasoning is a conception of people addressing other human beings just as other human beings and speaking just as another human being. It's one human being presenting an idea to other human beings at large. And actually, he does say scholars cannot be limited, galanter in, in their public use of reason. And some people have taken that to mean that he has a sort of an elitist conception of who has freedom of the pen, freedom of expression. But I actually think if you look at the context, look the way, uh, uh, at the way he's otherwise talking about reasoning, both in this essay and in the companion piece, What is Orientation and Thinking? He doesn't mean scholars, strictly speaking. He is not speaking about people who, only people who have a professorial position or a, a PhD. After all, many people in his day participated in that kind of general public discussion who were not professionals, as it were. Even David Hume and Gottschall Blessing and many of people that people can't knew and was friend, were friends with, they would write for journals and they would participate in the general discussion of, of, of philosophical ideas without having a specific scholarly role. And I think when he says scholars, he means people who are speaking in scholarly capacity. And that is to say they are presenting ideas simply in order to reflect on those ideas, even if they are issues of the public interest, political issues, issues about economics, religious issues. They just want to discuss them as one human being to another. In that sense, I think it's very egalitarian. But here, the most interesting point, I think, is this. By calling that kind of discussion public, Kant implies what he doesn't actually say in the Enlightenment essay, but does say in the companion, what I take to be the companion piece, what is orientation and thinking. He implies that we should speak in a public manner, meaning we should give reasons that any other human being should, could accept. And that, that, that will become an important principle in what is in orientation and in, in thinking, that I should not give reasons that are simply simply make sense to people who are just like me in some respect, who share my tastes, my preferences, my biases, uh, my role, I should be speaking using reasons that I think any other hum human being could use in my place. And I think that's a very interesting implication of describing this scholarly discussion as public, which he will play out elsewhere. So on the simple level, you just have to understand that when he talks about private and public, he's reversed. He, he's using the terms in the reverse way from the way we use them today, such that it's the public use of reason that always has to be free and the private uh, can be restricted by one specific role. But I think more interestingly is an implication here that having a specific role is a kind of limitation on what I can say and maybe even what I what I normally think, while speaking in the public way, that is speaking as one human being to another, that's speaking as fully me. Speaking that that is really the capacity in which I can most fully think about ideas for their own sake. But implicitly, that is also the capacity in which I should only use reasons that I think any other human being could understand or accept. That is very helpful. And then maybe um, one last uh, thought that comes to mind has to do with sort of the conception of reasoning that is also being discussed in sort of contemporary literature, where some people might think about reasoning from sort of a procedural perspective, like in actuality, reasoning is happening, for example, in a public sphere, uh, while other people, uh, uh, for example, might emphasize sort of a modal conception of reasoning. It's not really about what's actually happening in the public sphere in real time. It's really about what are sort of the, like maybe necessary conditions of the possibility of there being proper reasoning that could be addressed to the world at large. Like, do you have uh, uh, sort of a specific interpretation that you think sort of Kant is emphasizing? Is it much more like procedural conception where this is actually happening in, uh, in actuality? Or do you think that there's also some force in sort of thinking about it from like a, a modal uh, perspective? Okay, so look, um, I think it's fair to say that most of Kant's work, certainly in the critiques, is about the conditions for reasoning in general and not about actual discourse. Um, and even when he talks about the kinds of reasons that you ought to put forward in the public realm, as in, for instance, what is orientation and thinking, which is, I think, another piece on what is enlightenment. I talk about those two together, and I think they actually uh, function together a great deal, and Honora O'Neill certainly, uh, 
uh, takes that as a source for a lot of her thinking about Kant. So even when he tells you at the end of that piece um, that you should use as a rule for reasoning um, that a, anything you take to be a reason should be something you, and you think anyone else could take as a reason, right? A kind of categorical imperative for reasoning. The point there is to discipline your own thinking primarily. It isn't primarily about what you're going to say in the public realm. Although uh, even there, however, I think that one loses some of the point of that essay if you forget that the last part of the essay is directed to the fides of Kant's time, what the people call the en en enthusiasts, including his friends, uh, Haman and Jacobi, or people that he was somewhat friendly with, who he thought were offering reasons that couldn't be universalized. We're relying on a kind of religious experience that couldn't be universalized. And he thought that could have a dangerous effect by encouraging other enthusiasts to proceed on the basis of their religious experience and in particularly had in mind Frederick William, who was about to come to the throne, who used his conversations with Jesus as the basis for policy and Kant thought that was going to be very dangerous and indeed would shut down freedom of expression in, in Prussia. And Kant was quite right, that's in fact what happened. But to understand that Kant's worried about that is to understand he's worried about actual discourse. He's not just worried about what I think. He's not just giving me a rule for disciplining my reasoning. He's also talking about the reasons you put forward in the public realm here, construed either politically or in a scholarly way. And he's concerned about the effect of certain kinds of reasoning, that certain kinds of apparent reasoning will have on political events. Uh, and so there, I think it's not just a modal conception of using discourse as a way of thinking about reasoning that actually goes on entirely within an individual mind. He's actually talking about real conversation. He's concerned about the conditions for real conversation. He wants this kind of discipline. He has the sort of epistemic categorical imperative, as it were, that you get at the end of what is the orientation of thinking. He wants that to be something that individuals use when they engage in actual discourse in the public realm. Um, and in that sense, I think Rawls is right and O'Neill is not right, that, that Rawls is public use of reason, public reasoning, it's actually a, a clearly a descendant of what Kant's worried about there. The other thing I want to say, I've written about this elsewhere, not in this book so much. In the critique of judgment, he does seem to be interested in actual conversation. He appeals constantly to what we say uh, when we call something beautiful. And how, when I say this rose is beautiful, I don't simply mean it pleases me and so forth. But there's a uh, repeated reference to actual conversation in the book, which I take very seriously. I think it's no accident that Stanley Cavell married Kant and Wittgenstein primarily via, via the critique of judgment. There is a way in which suddenly Kant seems to be interested in actual conversation there and not just in um, discourse as a, as a modal way of getting it at, at, at individual reasoning. So I, I wouldn't say that he's just interested in discourse as, an, as a way of getting at reasoning. I think he is actually, he's interested in actual discourse. Does that address what the concern that you were raising? Certainly, yeah, yeah, no, that, that very much helps a lot. <laughs> and, and then maybe moving to sort of like, uh, I would say like the, the crucial interpretive move, right, that you make in the book, which is really by proposing uh, uh, dividing Kant's enlightenment into sort of this minimalist strand and then a maximalist strand, right? And, and one way how you sort of uh, uh, cast that out or phrase that, right, in sort of a, a simple uh, manner is to sort of divide uh, the minimalist uh, strand into focusing on the question how to think, right? Like trying to address that question. And then the maximalist uh, conception is actually trying to answer the question what to think, right? So maybe you could just elaborate on how you even got sort of to that point where you sort of saw, oh, this makes sense. Uh, and then, and, and, yeah, I would love to hear that. Yeah, great. Um, so that was a moment when suddenly the book came into focus for me. And I think it arose out of worrying about the following question. You read What is Enlightenment? And it looks as if Kant is 
just saying, think for yourself, right? Don't rely on authorities. And implicitly, that means don't rely on me either. Don't rely on my books. You don't need to read the critique of pure reason. You don't need to read the groundwork. You don't need to read my books. Think for yourself. Whatever you come up with, that will be enlightened. If you rely on me as an authority, that won't be enlightened, right? I mean, maybe you'll agree with me. Maybe you won't. It sounds very open. And it sounds as very minimal, basically. Enlightenment is quite simple. And he says in What is Orientation and Thinking, which again, I think of as the sort of counterpart piece, the pair, uh, the piece that goes with it, um, that my conception of enlightenment, his conception of enlightenment is much, there's much less to it. So it really does use the language of, of something being minimal than there is in other conceptions, because he's not saying you have to be scientifically very well informed, that you have to understand a certain metaphysics or epistemology, you have to adopt a particular view of politics or religion. It sounds as if anyone can do it, and it's very widely available if you only have the courage and the energy to think for yourself. But later on, Kant is known for basically saying that, and it, for one thing, and I, one of the things that I focus on in the book is that the, that the topic in, around which he discusses religion, uh, enlightenment is religion. It's religion that stands in the way of enlightenment. That's not an uncommon uh, view or can stand in the way of enlightenment. Um, and his although his worry in what is enlightenment is just that clerical authorities are too closed to allowing their doctrines to change. He doesn't say we have to give up Christianity or any other traditional religion. He just says they have to allow free discussion. So again, in what is enlightenment and in what is orientation of thinking, it sounds as if he's just concerned with how to think in the sense that we have to think for ourselves and we have to not rely blindly on authorities. Uh, we have to question authorities. We can't just get things out of books. Later on, in Religion Within Boundaries of Mere Reason and the Conflict of Faculties, you get more of a sense that unless you share Kant's own rational moral, moral religion, you're unenlightened, which would actually go with views of people like Hume, for instance. Many other enlighteners would say, yes, if you're stuck with those traditional, ritualistic, superstitious religions, you're not enlightened. And that seems to contradict, or at least be in tension with the nice open, broad conception of enlightenment that you get in the two pieces from the 1780s, uh, what is enlightenment and what is orientation and thinking. And many people have read Kant as if basically what he's saying is, unless you agree with me about morality, that morality is founded on reason and not on sentiment, for instance, about religion, probably about politics, about epistemology, you're not enlightened you're still stuck in old fashioned metaphysics or superstitious religion or um, reactionary politics. You basically have to agree with my view of the world or you're not enlightened. People have read him that way. And the, those who read him that way, I think are reading him as though all of that's already implicit in what is enlightenment. You certainly can find elements of Kant in which it seems as if everyone who doesn't share his rationalism, his views on morality, religion, politics, etc., is unenlightened. But that doesn't seem to be true in those two journal pieces of the 1780s. So you could say, well, the journal pieces, they don't give the full view. He's holding his cards close to the chest. He's not being fully honest. He really thinks if you start thinking for yourself in the right way, you'll come around to his views. But you could also say, you could say he changed his mind and became somewhat more arrogant, shall we say, about what you had to be in order to be enlightened. Or you could say that um, his fuller view, what I call his more maximalist view, the view in which you really need to agree with him on so many other issues, is something that he does recommend but doesn't insist on as a condition for being an enlightened person, that actually the minimal 
conception of enlightenment in the two journal pieces of the 1780s is his conception of enlightenment. Nevertheless, as a person who has thought about these things, he has a view about where he'd like to see people end up, but, but that's not a condition for enlightenment. And I couldn't decide whether Kant really was pushing for the maximal view or the minimal one. And eventually I thought he actually is ambivalent. And one good way of explaining his legacy, and this is why it was a key to, to writing the book later on, and understanding his influence on the people who were inspired by them, by him, is to recognize that there's a, a part of him that does want everybody to agree with him in all these different respects. And there's a part of him who just wants people to think for themselves, even if they disagree with him. Uh, and a part of him that, that really means think for yourself in the full sense in which that means, among other things, you don't have to agree with me. So that's what led me to think there's a minimal stand, minimalist strand and a maximalist strand. Some people like the maximalist strand and agree that enlightenment really requires you to become a full-blown rationalist of some kind, wherever that may lead. And others like the minimalist strand and think, no, we can't demand that of everyone. All we can demand is a space in which everybody is thinking for themselves and whatever else might be entailed in, in being enlightened. Actually, I, as, as you know, we'll probably get to this later. I think think for yourself is only one piece of what he calls enlightenment. And especially if you put the, that, the essay, what is enlightenment together with the essay, what is an orientation and thinking, and you emphasize this sort of epistemic categorical imperative at the end of what is orientation and thinking, you realize that for Kant, there's another part of being enlightened. On the one hand, you should think for yourself. On the other hand, you should be offering reasons that you think any other rational being could also see as reasons. Um, and I still think, I think even that can be construed as part of the minimalist enlightenment, not the maximalist enlightenment, uh, but it gives a somewhat robust guide for how to think without telling you what to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's very helpful. So I think now we just have to dive more into you know, these different trends and start to figure yeah. out uh, where we can land uh, on this. Uh, question. And um, so, I mean, here you start right with one of the, the big critics of Kant. So Hegel, uh, uh, you identify as, you know, the, the, the founder, I guess, of the, the maximalist uh, uh, strand, right? So what is Hegel criticizing, right? And how does that lead him to become, I guess, the founder of the maximalist uh, strand? So I'm not sure that those two things go exactly together. But what Hegel is certainly criticizing in Kant is Kant's ignoring of history and his construal of reasoning as a purely individualist matter. And those two things go together. For Hegel, if you properly think through um, how we think, you recognize we don't think as individuals alone, we think as part of a social whole. Those social wholes also change across time. So the historical era, the historical environment in which we uh, find ourselves will set terms that that are essential to our thinking. Um, and in that sense, the idea that each individual should just say, I'll think for myself, all by myself, as it were, question all the authorities, Hegel thinks is naive and is, reflects Kant's un, lack of interest, lack of attention, both to the social aspects of our uh, our being of, of who we are and to the historical aspects, those being interlinked, right? So in that sense, Hegel doesn't accept Kant's starting point and provide some powerful reasons for resisting that individualist conception of thinking. On the other hand, Hegel does accept the idea that we need to get beyond prejudices. Um, he, I, I certainly share the view of Hegel by which he's fundamentally a liberal politically who believes in freedom of expression, he certainly does, he's quite explicit about that and believes in a sort of procedural state in which individual rights are respected and so forth. So in those respects, he's quite like Kant. And he agrees with Kant that religious doctrine in particular needs to be mutable, needs to be open to change. Um, and that again was a focus of what is enlightenment that if we start thinking for ourselves, we'll recognize that we can't just accept the word of various 
clerical authorities around us, and the clerical authorities themselves can't just rely on dogmas from the past. They have to be open to thinking things through anew and changing their doctrines if, if that seems appropriate. And all of that Hegel shares. But given Hegel's understanding of how history works and how history brings us to greater understanding of who we are and of our universe. I resist the sen uh, re resist using the word enlightenment because enlightenment suggests there's a period of darkness followed by a period of light. And Hegel doesn't think things work in that sharp way. That's another thing he resists about not only Kant's conception of enlightenment, but all the conceptions of the enlightenment, the period that saw itself as, enlight uh, as the enlightenment. Hegel says, as the one who names that, is a period that thought it was coming out of complete darkness into complete light. And he thought there wasn't as much darkness as these people say beforehand, and there isn't as much light afterwards. Everything is much more gradual, more dialectical, of course. Uh, but he does believe in progress and believes that we move ever more to, to an ever more complete understanding of God, ourselves, universe, philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, not accidentally, therefore also thinks that his own dialectical working out of how reasoning works, how history works, what conclusions that leads us to about religion, about morality and so forth, about politics, is better than all the views that have come before, is an improvement that must be an improvement given the nature of the dialectic. It's not just personal arrogance here, it must be an improvement on everything that has come before. And in that sense, he can't help but be a maximalist. It's not just a matter of everybody should think for themselves, question their authorities, try to think responsibly in the sense of coming up with reasons that they think could be acceptable to any other human being, any other rational being. Um, we have to think in accordance with the stage of history we've arrived at and recognize that that stage has and must have improved on what's come before. And in that sense, we can't fully be free. We can't fully achieve, realize our, our nature, achieve whatever it is we're supposed to achieve morally and epistemically unless we recognize that we are in a superior position to all who have come before us, and in particular that's, that Hegel's own views are superior to those that have come before. So in that sense, he initiates the idea that once we move along in history, we come to a stage in which a great deal, maybe everything that has believed in the past needs to be revised, and those who uh, don't go along with the shift, are, are confused, ignorant, have made some kind of error, and need to be, should at least, come into the new stage we're in. And uh, so Hegel certainly does not think we can just accept certain minimal conditions of, of thought, and then we're okay, we really ought to all become Hegelians. Um, and that's very much what I call the maximalist view. And, and maybe um, taking sort of one step back, and this might be a, a bit of a side path, right? But when see some people critique sort of maybe Kant's view of either reason or maybe enlightenment more broadly as sort of ahistorical, right? Like that it misses either this historical dimension or that it misses sort of this social uh, dimension that might be historically uh, located. Uh, one uh, 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 thought that comes to mind because I was reading uh, a bit of Foucault, right? And apparently Foucault actually reads Kant and actually highlights that there's sort of this immediacy, this nowness in Kant's view uh, on enlightenment. So I, I just wanted, uh, 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 if you sort of think, uh, uh, you know, if this sort of critique, right, by Hegel, for example, or maybe just more broadly, right, like this critique of being ahistorical or asocial, right, do you think that sort of holds up uh, uh, as much as people claim it uh, uh, to, to uh, hold up? Well, as you know, I love the Foucault's readings of what is enlightenment and the emphasis on the nowness, the present, the sort of thinking about one's own stage in history. And I think, and, and Foucault notes, for instance, that Kant is pretty much the first philosopher to do serious philosophical thinking in a newspaper, in a journal, which is very a public, uh, you know, a popular newspaper. 
which is that, and of course that, that's something Foucault himself did and Habermas has done, but not so many philosophers do. And he celebrates that and he takes it to be a mark um, of Kant's sensitivity to the difference between his age and prior ages and interest in addressing his age uh, as to where they are. And that's true. And Kant was very interested in what are we doing right now? That's something that Foucault picks up on, and not just in what is enlightenment, but also in the idea for universal history and in his writings, his theory and practice essay. He's often thinking about uh, events of the present day and what progress looks like and what, how fast it should come and so forth. But he doesn't think of history as intrinsically a way of uncovering truth. He doesn't think, uh, he, he hasn't thought, he think, he, he's aware of his historical era. He's interested in it. He thinks it's a great thing that there's more freedom to speak now than in the past. But he doesn't think in uh, any more robust way about the difference between his age and prior ages. And he certainly doesn't think that the truth about anything, including metaphysics or religion is progressively unveiled by way of historical events. History doesn't in itself contribute to reasoning. And that's, of course, something that Hegel takes to task for. So even if Kant is more aware of his historical period uh, than you know, might come across if you think of him as this individualist thinker who's just coming up with a priori uh, conditions for the possibility of knowledge and morality and so forth. And if Foucault, and, and, and even if, as Foucault says, you can see that awareness of his historical period in what is enlightenment and some of the other periods from, uh, pieces he wrote for journals, um, he's not really thinking through how history can contribute to philosophy's own work, as it were. While it does for Hegel, and it must, but that it, entails that if you are at a later historical period, you should recognize that there are certain things that you now should, we can now understand uh, that just supersede what people thought in the past. Uh, you can't just go back there. It's not like there's a whole menu of options open to you. The ones we've come to that have been shown to us as it were, or that we have come to recognize in the course of our history are the correct ones. Um, and uh, you don't, it, it, it's not as if there's some broad menu of different equally re reasonable views available to us. If you're not a Lutheran for Hegel, if you are a Jew or a Muslim uh, or a Hindu, you are stuck in an earlier stage of spirit and you're wrong. You're, you shouldn't be stuck there. Uh, now, whether Hegel himself wanted us to move on from Lutheran Christianity to some kind of Hegelian pantheism, as, as people think, some people think, as the young Hegelians thought, or whether he uh, actually was all in favor of Lutheran Christianity and thought that that was the highest stage of religion. That's a little unclear, and I think Hegel's deliberately cagey about letting people know where, whether he's a conservative or a radical about that. But he certainly thinks it improves on er earlier and other kinds of religion. And that's the one religion specifically that everyone ought to uphold, uh, even if he doesn't want to crack down on people for not upholding it. This is the right religion, and Kant never says that. Kant thinks all religions need some kind of reformation, but even at his most uh, reformist, he doesn't say everyone has to be Christian, let alone a, a Lutheran. And, and then maybe when we move uh from Hegel to Marx, right? And here I just would like to mention uh, um, one quote uh, from the book. Um, so you uh, you um, state, Marx thinks his predecessors went wrong, not just in the limited object of their critiques, but in the mode of critique they pursued. True critique is, is impossible without social revolution. Um, so could you maybe just comment, obviously, uh, uh, this is again taking Marx now as sort of a, a maximalist conception, uh, uh, right? Um, so in what sense, right, is it uh, like previous critiques have been limited in their object, right? And then the mode of critique, like what's wrong uh, uh, with that before sort of uh, uh, Marx uh, theory? Yeah, so I'm just going to fill in a little bit, if that's okay, between uh, on what happens between 
uh, Hegel and Marx. So I indicated just now that Hegel was kind of cagey. He was taken to be cagey at least about whether he thought Lutheran Christianity was just fine. And that's a sort of highest stage of religious and maybe metaphysical consciousness that, that we have come to. Although I think a close reader of the phenomenology would not expect him to say that. Um, or whether he really wanted us to move beyond Christianity to Hegelianism, if you will. And the big divide after Hegel died, the one that leads to the difference between the left and the right Hegelians or the young Hegelians and other Hegelians is precisely over his view of religion. Um, and it's made explicit in a little book by David Friedrich Strauss, who actually explicitly draws that distinction. And the young Hegelians are the ones who think, no, Christianity needs a, 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 a rather radical critique. Uh, either to move beyond Christianity altogether, or at least to a very rationalized new kind of Christianity. And they are, in my sense, maximalist, because they think that's what everybody has to believe, whether, whether a highly reformed Christianity or something that's sort of post-Christian, uh, in order to be enlightened. And so Strauss begins some of that movement, as it were, beyond Hegel towards a more rationalist kind of religion. And then other figures like Bruno Bauer and Max Stirner take that up and uh, Ludwig Feuerbach famously. And by the time you get to, well, even Stirner, but certainly Feuerbach, it's pretty clear that in order to be enlightened, you need to be an atheist. Uh, Feuerbach is very explicit about that. L human emancipation, that's the term that he prefers, comes with atheism and without atheism, if you're still stuck with a notion of a God. What you're doing is worshiping a projection of yours yourself, which is really a fantasy. And until we get beyond that, we will never really be emancipated. And I think in many ways, Feuerbach is still a Kantian, a more radical Kantian, who wants us to be autonomous and wants us to be, uh, to stand on our own two feet, definitely wants us to think for ourselves, but he thinks we can't do that unless we're atheists. He also thinks we need to be materialists. I'll, I'll play that down for the moment. But yes, basically you need to be an atheist and a materialist in order to be emancipated from Feuerbach. And of course, Marx famously follows on the heels of Feuerbach. He agrees with Feuerbach about everybody needs to be a materialist and atheist. Of course, he fully endorses that. Um, but first of all, he thinks there's been too much focus on religion. I think one of the things I wanted to do with my book is stress how much the whole issue about enlightenment, certainly for Kant and actually for many others at the time, is really about religion. What kind of religion we ought to have, if any. And I think so many academics today are secular that they, they find it very difficult to take religion seriously at all. And I should say personally, because I have been throughout an, an observant Jew, I'm always struggling with the tension between secular scholarship and being a religious person. So it's a personally interesting to me, but I have, in addition, I think it's a serious misunderstanding of the enlightenment and indeed of the whole trajectory of thought from the early 17th century through the uh, mid 19th century to think that this is a bunch of secular scholars who had no interest in religion. They have a great interest in religion, even if they hate it. Uh, and, and religion is, is the locus of debates about enlightenment. But Marx says another passage that I quote explicitly, critique begins with religion, but it shouldn't end there. And he wants to imply the kind of critique that Feuerbach especially had launched of religion, that is of religion as a kind of projection of our fantasies, he wants to apply that to liberal ideas, ideas about rights, which he thinks are basically a set of fantasies that uh, preserve the bourgeoisie in power and um, allow us to think that the individual private ownership of capital is legitimate. Uh, with uh, ways of legitimating capitalism. So, and, and he says explicitly, we have to move from theology to politics. So that's his critique of the object of critique before him. He thinks that, it's not that he thinks it was wrong to criticize religion, you do need to criticize religion. He completely affirms that and it's the start of all critique. But we have to move on from there to criticize political ideology, uh, which deserves the same kind of critique and is in fact more important.
political, economic ideology. So that's one piece of what he says. But the other piece is, given his materialism, given his view that ideas are mostly there, arise and are, and are promoted in order to protect the ruling class, and the ruling class is defined basically by their control over the means of production. Mere intellectual critique is never going to be adequate to get rid of our fantasies, particularly our political fantasies. So the idea that critique just means coming up with a, a, an analysis of what's wrong with certain ideas, including religious ideas, that's completely inadequate for him. Unless you change the material conditions we live under, you will not be able even to think clearly. Um, and that's why what we need is not just critique, but revolution. Unless we have revolution that can overturn the uh, means of production we have right now, the mode of production we have right now, that, that overturns the private ownership of capital, we will continue to have ideas that protect the private ownership of capital. So we will not even get political critique without revolution. That's, of course, his, his, his critique of Feuerbach, that he's much too much an intellectual, and unless you're out of the barricades, trying to change the social structure, trying to revolutionize the society we live in, you're not even going to succeed in your critique. So that, I think it's a very interesting move, whether one accepts it or not. It is a maximalist move in the sense that Marx certainly believes everybody has to agree with him. We all have to become communists. And... Uh, but in his case, not only does he think we need to be communists, we need to be atheists, but we actually have to institute a communist mode of society before we can even understand fully why we need to be communists and atheists. And we can't come into, again, for him, the term would be more emancipation than enlightenment. We can't come into full human emancipation intellectually alone. Um, we can only do that via social change. And maybe dwelling a bit more on like the point about the mode of critique, right? And maybe also trying to even pull that sort of in, in uh, contemporary uh, uh, discussion, I suppose. So uh, one thought that comes to mind uh, is a, a book I read from, from uh, Jonathan Israel, which is called like the revolution of the mind, right? Which might, might illustrate this intellectualist sort of position, right? It's the revolution of ideas that can actually manifest uh, uh, change, right? So in what sense, uh, um, uh, uh, and then even, you know, going back to Kant's point, right, where enlightenment is maybe more practical, right? That might be more easily connected with, not necessarily intellectualist, but actually with like taking action, right? So in what sense, uh, um, um, still the point about the mode of critique, right? Like, can we still say, yes, it demands action, right? But it just demands action. Uh, I mean, yeah, so maybe just a more basic question would just be, right? Like. How far should we go along with saying, yes, enlightenment does demand action in sort of a, a social manner? Interesting. Interesting. You are actually trying to make Marx more like Kant than I would. Um, it's certainly true and something I stress, as I, I did even in your interview with me, that one, one of the wonderful and, and surprising things about Kant's want is enlightenment is that enlightenment turns out to be a stance towards action, a, a matter of courage and of uh, energy, as I call it, as opposed to laziness, uh, rather than simply an intellectual state. Uh, the point is that you will come to the intellectual state in which you are reasoning properly or even beginning to reason properly only if you stop lazily and, uh, and, and in a cowardly way relying on what other people tell you, right? You have to push away your fear of authorities um, and start thinking for yourself before you can start reasoning properly. So there's a kind of action involved there, or at least there's a kind of change of attitude, which uh, is a stance towards action. First of all, as you indicated in your question to me, it's an individualist stance. It doesn't require so large social change. It does require social, for society to enlighten itself. We need certain institutions and above all freedom of the pen, he says. Um, but it's also, enlightenment is also an individual state. Even in society with the freedom of the pen, many individuals won't be enlightened. And even in societies where there's no freedom of the pen, some individuals will be enlightened if only they have the right courage and for their daring to know, as it were. So that's very different from the kind of social action that Marx is calling for. 
uh, Kant also, of course, believes in the right to private property and has no problem with capitalism. So they, they certainly wouldn't be calling for exactly the same social action. Um, but in any case, even at his most maximalist, Kant does not call for anything remotely like the full-scale social change that, that Marx is calling for. Never mind right now whether that change has to take the form of uh, public ownership of the means of production, which of course is what Marx stands for, but even the idea that society needs to change radically in any, in any other way. Today we, today, we might be looking for a society that sort of radically eradicated in some form or other uh, racism, sexism, and so forth. Kant doesn't lay out social changes like that as conditions for enlightenment. Um, and if he did, he would be a maximalist. Um, I, and he would be a full-scale maximalist. You would really have to go along with a very thick, robust program of social change in order to be enlightened or to expect your society to be enlightened. Um, now, I think that's a plus on Kant's side. Some people would say, no, Marx is right. But of course, one reason why they might differ here regardless of who you want to side with, is that is, Marx thinks ideas are nothing but, or very little but, um, coverings for material structures or epiphenomena of material structures. Um, given that strongly materialist base in which ideas really arise out of, that just belong to the superstructure, right? Because they arise out of economic relations. Of course, he thinks you need to change those economic relations in order to change your ideas. Kant certainly doesn't believe anything like that. He's not a materialist. He, uh, on the metaphysical question, whether he's a materialist or an idealist, I think it's important to remember that he actually thinks that's not a question that reason can settle. He does not go one way or another. He doesn't think you can prove or disprove Spinoza, for instance. But in the sense in which materialism means that you see something like social conditions or the conditions of the mode of production as the base out of which all ideas arise, I think Kant would find that horrifying and, in fact, undermining of the notion of autonomy as he sees it. So I, even if there is a kind of stance towards action in Kant, I think it's so different from Marx that uh, it's hard even to compare them. No, that that uh, makes a lot of sense. And then maybe uh, um, uh, just moving towards the point or moving to the point, I suppose, uh, where, you know, Kant's universalist approach to enlightenment has been like heavily scrutinized uh, by many uh, different uh, groups in sort of a contemporary uh, setting, right? And, and maybe one objection that you uh, describe is sort of coming from the feminist critique, right? Uh, and, and that critique or that objection really focuses, I mean, it's also called the objections uh, uh, of difference, I suppose, right? Like where Kant doesn't allow, or I, I'm not sure if allow is the right word, but anyway, like the difference, right? Does that get enough uh, currency, I suppose, in, in Kant's uh, uh, view? Um, of uh, enlightenment. So yeah, how should we maybe deal with that, right? Like does Kant address or maybe, you know, not address and maybe that's objectionable, this objection uh, uh, of difference? Yeah, um, the, what I call the difference critics of Kant come from many different directions. They include um, conservatives and communitarians who think that he doesn't pay enough attention to historical communities and to culture. They include race critics, feminist critics, um, to some extent, various kinds of Hegelians and Marxists also. I mean, this is wrapped up or related to at least the critique that Kant doesn't pay enough attention to the historical conditions and the social conditions for thought. And a lot of that is true. Kant mostly argues, even if I want to say there's more room for actual discourse, actual conversation in Kant than people often recognize, and even if he's aware of his historical age as different from other ages, as Foucault recognizes, um, much of Kant, certainly the three critiques, can be read as an individual solipsistic thinker thinking for all humanity in the solid, uh, um, solitude of his own room. In addition, feminists are right to say that Kant was had sexist attitudes that comes out in various places. 
he had racist attitudes as well. He had anti-Semitic attitudes. Whether those actually infect the rest of his philosophy is a contested issue, but it certainly might, they certainly might at certain points. He doesn't, he doesn't devote much of his philosophy to discussing differences between race and gender, although he talks about it in his anthropology, but not in his core critical works. I'm just actually teaching Hegel's philosophy of right to a student. I have to go to that in, um, in about an hour. And Hegel has long sections developing the metaphysics of the difference between men and women. Um, and that's centrally there in the philosophy of right. And it's quite sexist, actually. Um, those things could have appeared in Kant, but they don't. <laughs> he doesn't talk about that. So the question is, is there some kind of sexism or built into Kant? That, that's one question, or racism built into Kant's moral philosophy or its conception of, of enlightenment. And then a second question is, even if there isn't, is he oblivious to the difference among human beings? And, and to some extent, those two things run together because one critique you get from some feminists is that he is uh, oblivious to the differences in, in women's ways of thinking. But of course, there are other feminists who think that that's not actually a good way of putting the feminist case, but they think that nevertheless, um, there, there's a sexism in Kant that's problematic. Well, I side with those who think that for all Kant's racist, sexist, anti-Semitic attitudes, that's sort of on the side of his moral philosophy and it doesn't really affect the moral philosophy. Even if it did, it wouldn't necessarily affect his view of enlightenment, which certainly sounds, think for yourself, that could apply to anybody anywhere. It doesn't sound, it's very hard to see how they, or e even the idea think, in the place of everyone else, or to use reasons that could have, that that you think anyone could use. There's, there's nothing obviously racist, sexist, anti-Semitic about that. However, especially if you focus on that second rule, think you use reasons that you think any other rational being would use as well. That does sound like a kind of universalism that leaves no room for people in different historical situations and different social contexts. Um, different have, people who have different religious views having different kinds of reasons that might not be commensurable. And that's the critique that I take most seriously. And I do think that Kant himself had not much use for reasons that depend on depend for their force in any way on one's placement in a particular community. There is a sense in which I think the difference critics are right, that Kant uh, does want you always to reason as if you were anyone and does not recognize that sometimes you actually need to reason as a Jew, as a black person, a black person in America versus a black person in Africa, as a woman rather than a man. Uh, particularly when you're talking about various kinds of social and political problems. Sometimes when you're talking about religious problems, uh, when you're talking about um, issues that are particular to a particular, uh, to, 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 uh, to your community, you may appeal to reasons that make most sense in the context of a particular group and not, and don't necessarily make sense to everyone. What I say to that critique is that whatever Kant may have said, independently of what Kant himself said about reasoning, if you can make a case that in the, such and such circumstances, one ought to appeal to women specific re reasons or reasons that African-American reasons, reasons that makes most sense to the African-American community or on behalf of the African-American community, to Jewish reasons, Jew reasons that make most sense within a Jewish context. Well, as long as you've got a universalist case for that kind of differential reasoning, I think you live up to Kant's epistemic categorical imperative. That is to say, I think that Kant's rules for enlightenment, think for yourself, and as I sometimes translate it simply, think responsibly, but that means think by way of reasons that you think anyone else could uphold that are not specific to you. Even that second rule 
can allow for differential reasoning as long as you can make a, a case in universalist terms that differentialist, differential reasoning is appropriate in this circumstance. That is to say, if you can make a case that there are women's ways of thinking, which at least in today's historical era uh, differ from men's ways of thinking, and men overlook those women's ways of thinking, and you want to appeal to certain ways of thinking that you think men are overlooking, men including Kant, well, then you've made a general case for a specific way of thinking, if that makes sense. And if you think there are certain reasons that will make most sense to an ethnic or racial or religious community and won't be that clear to others, but you can give reasons, why, meta reasons as it were, why it's appropriate in these circumstances to use those community specific modes of reasoning, then I think you've met the demands of the um, epistemic categorical imperative. Now I, re I realize this is not everybody's view. Um, not, there are people who would think this whole idea of community specific modes of reasoning is ridiculous. And certainly many people would say, even if whether it's ridiculous or not, Kant wouldn't recognize it. But I don't see why if a rational, uh, why if a rational case can be made for those community specific modes of reasoning, I don't see why that can't fit into Kant's minimalist notion of enlightenment. I think it allows for that kind of different differential reasoning. One comment to that would be, and I'm not sure if this is um, a consequence that you would accept, right? If we would go along with what you just mentioned, right? Like, would you accept that we get to a point where we would be in a position of like truth pluralism, where the reasons that emerge, right, even though they have like universal ground, does provide maybe perspective or community reasons, right? That that commits us to sort of like truth, truth pluralism, uh, which is potentially fine, right? It just happens that, you know, those reasons maybe are valid in specific circumstances, right? But um, so it's not a problematic notion, like would you be happy with that or do you think that's taking it too far? Yeah, I'm inclined to say that's taking it too far. Certainly on Kant's behalf it is. Um, I, w I wonder if I can come up with some kind of example that might be helpful though. I'm doing it on my, my feet might not, it might be difficult. Um, so, in very broad strokes and talking about like an issue that would be more, that Kant might be more aware of than racial and gender issues, which he wasn't, he didn't really think about. Let's think about nationalist issues. You are today a Ukrainian insisting on the importance of Ukrainian independence rather than being swallowed up by Russia. Uh, and in Kant's own times, you might be a German nationalist or some more, specific nationalists, a Czech nationalist that would be a little early, but that could happen. And you want to talk about the importance of your language and your literature. And you realize that people who don't belong to your community don't care about your language and literature and don't see it as that valuable. But you want to say anybody who has been raised like me in this community will see why this this literature and speaking this language uh, is moving to me and gives me a, a reason to get up in the morning um, that, uh, that I wouldn't have otherwise. That would be a way of giving a community specific reason for a community specific project which outsiders to the community can recognize as potentially valid if they lived in the community, if you know what I mean. You're not saying this piece of Czech literature, everybody has to love. You're basically saying we Czechs love it and that's important to us. So you are appealing at least on the meta level to principles that anybody could hold, right? And now here, to go from that kind of example to the things that concern race, race racial and, and, and feminist criticism, just think about the fact that people, even radical feminists like Catherine McKinnon write books to defend their political procedures um, or Carol Gilligan, right? their, their notion of differences between men's and women's reasoning. And they write the books using reasons that they think can appeal to any rational being. Right. So on the meta level, they are using universalist reasons to defend specific modes of reasoning, but those specific modes of reasoning <coughs> don't issue in truths that contradict one another. They may issue in different emphases, 
different things that are important to people. They may issue in different senses of what's beautiful or, or horrifying or degrading. Um, but they don't issue in truth claims that contradict one another. There needn't be any, there could be truth claims at worst or at most, which the member of the community claim, can see and outsiders do not grasp or do not, they don't quite understand why the community holds those beliefs. Or maybe they don't quite understand the beliefs. They certainly might not understand a certain attitude, but they understand why they don't understand the beliefs. They don't understand why they don't share the attitudes. So in that sense, I don't think that this has to issue in one community believing P and another community believing not P. I think that would be problematic and then both being true somehow. Um, I don't want to say both COVID is real and COVID is not real. And if you're in a community that believes COVID is not real, that's perfectly fine. No, that's not perfectly fine. I wouldn't say that's fine. I certainly wouldn't say that's fine. The point is simply that some difference, certainly in attitudes, and maybe in what, what's salient to you, what you take to be important, could, uh, could exist across communities and could be justified on the meta level by universalist reasons that recognize on a universal level that on some issues we, uh, we are more drawn to our communities or we depend more on our communities than on the community of human beings at large. Does that help? That helps a lot. And, and so like uh, maybe just to respond to that and, and you could let me know if I'm understanding it sort of properly. And then and, and I might also actually bring in one other thought uh, uh, that I uh, have about this sort of uh, myself. So in some sense, right, the meta level provides a space, right, where you could actually take different perspectives, even though you don't own certain identities, right, and you're not in certain circumstances. That meta level allows you to get accessibility to those reasons from a universalist ground that allow you to grasp the particularities that even though you don't experience them. So in that sense, there remains a common ground, right? Where yes. like communication happens. And I think that's the important point. And then maybe one thought that I'm thinking of myself, uh, uh, I'm trying to write an essay on this for a class of mine, uh, which has to do with trying to think about Kant's uh, enlightenment, right? And also about this view about public reason and private reason from an identity perspective. Obviously now in contemporary terms, like pol like identity politics is like, a big thing, right? And people right. have been approaching it. And I'm sort of thinking maybe context to provide an angle in, into thinking about identity politics, right? Because in some sense, the identity of us being human is a crucial way of stepping outside of our particular identities to then assess those particular identities, right? So anyway, that's another thought. I'm not sure if you think that there's anything there uh, that seems plausible to you. <laughs> um, no, no, that's very plausible to me. And here I'm happy to say I mean, I may be much too much of a cultural pluralist for many Kantians, but what you just said, I think you can find in Chris Korsgaard's Sources of Normativity. There are practices, she doesn't emphasize the local practical identities, but she does seem to think that those are important to us. It's just that she says, without the human identity that we all share, we can't even validate, we can't, we can't show, the, show what is valuable about the more local practical identities. And that's very much the sort of thing I want to say. Here is an example that I think will work and I hope it's not offensive to people, but I think people my age, which is now getting up there, I'm sorry to say, um, 10, 15 years ago, it was very hard for us to understand what the fuss was about trans, uh, transgender identity. And hearing that people couldn't go to the bathroom of, their, of the gender they identify with, for many people over 50, over 60, certainly it was like, what exactly, why is this a big issue? However, by now, I think many of us have been con uh, convinced that it is an, a very serious issue by way of reasons that appeal to all human beings, even if the upshot of those reasons is you can't really understand what it's like to be transgender. I can give you some sense of why it's terribly shaming, painful, certainly if it's dangerous to have to use a, a, a bath, uh, the bathroom of a gender I don't identify with. But that doesn't mean that I, if I understand those reasons, actually know what it's like, right? I know that I don't know what it's like, but I have come to understand that it is indeed important to trans people to use the bathroom that they identify with. 
Well, that's a case in which a local community had certain kinds of experiences which inform the reasons they give for why, for instance, they consider certain, um, uh, certain kinds of things degrading, frightening, undermining of their respect, their self-respect and so forth. Outsiders like me didn't understand that, but we've come to understand it by way of common human reasons which validate, give, which, which give value to the local community, and which also explain why that local community differs from other local communities and maybe differs from those of us who are hearing this in the common perspective. So the common, the common human perspective is essential, even if you want to subdivide into different groups, or even if you want to recognize that different kinds of groups will have different experiences and that will matter a lot to what they consider to be important and what they consider to be terrible and so forth. So um, yes, I think that goes exactly with what you've, what you've just said. Um, and that would be, um, That's the way in which I think Kant's epistemic categorical imperative, although it says, think only, I'll give reasons only that you think every other rational being could hold. I think if you take that as operating on the meta level, yeah. it can justify sometimes giving reasons that only some groups of rational beings can, can share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, certainly. That, that's really helpful. And then maybe because, you know, we've been uh, discussing, I guess, uh, uh, mostly the maximalist strand. And then, I mean, we went obviously into some uh, other discussions as well, but now maybe uh, pulling it uh, towards sort of the minimalist uh, interpretation of uh, Kant's uh, enlightenment. And here uh, you uh, 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 invoke or put forward uh, Habermas and, 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 and Rawls, right, as, as two main uh, contenders that have sort of fleshed out what this minimalist strength, uh, uh, like this development of Kant's enlightenment might mean if we want to uh, take that into a specific uh, direction. So maybe you could say a word about how they don't enter into this maximalist strength and how they actually maybe further develop or maybe improve uh, 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 Kant's like minimalist uh, uh, interpretation. Good, yeah. Um, so just to re reiterate the general storyline of my book, I'm trying partly to explain why people like Feuerbach and Marx, Max Stirner before them, uh, come to a view by which basically, unless you accept their quite strong, radical ideas about how to transform our uh, society and our conceptions of morality and conceptions of religion, you're not in life, right? You need to be an atheist, you need to be a communist, you need to be a radical individualist for Max Stirner. And if you're not, then you're not enlightened very much the maximal strand, and in some cases, quite explicitly looking back to Kant, even if being, even if they've come to be more uh, radical than Kant. And, and for those people, being enlightened clearly or being emancipated, that might be the term they would use instead, is clearly a matter of what you believe and not just how you believe, right? Um, what I think is exciting and, and interesting about what's happened over the last, say, 50 years is that you have thinkers like Habermas and, uh, and uh, Rawls. They're not the only examples, though some of the other examples are their followers and colleagues. Um, and to some extent, this is also true of Foucault, who really do want to stress, who, who first of all have returned quite literally to Kant's what is enlightenment and what is orientation and thinking as inspirations for their own thought. And they use those essays in order precisely to develop conditions for reasonable conversation that would allow for a plurality of different, as Rawls would put it, different comprehensive uh, conceptions of how to live to, to work together. Um, that is you, what you have in Havamas and Rawls, and I think even in the late Foucault is an, a thought that we do not need to all share exactly the same views of religion, maybe even of morality. We can differ quite considerably. So in a lot of ways, they're, they're, they're giving a response to the difference critics, though not necessarily exactly in the lines I just gave. Uh, we can differ considerably and yet regard one another as enlightenment, enlightened or reasonable beings. And therefore, what they work on in the case of Habnas explicitly is the conditions for reasonable discourse. Very much, very explicitly, conditions 
for how to think and how to speak rather than what to think and what to think then what what it is reasonable think will then be a product of a discourse in which people all think reasonably without being committed to any particular view at the outset in the case of Rawls the way he uses these thoughts is more specifically in the political realm how can you get people who differ uh, radically and he thinks I think irresolvably on a comprehensive conception of how to live really does seem to think that those problem uh, differences are never going to be overcome how can they work together in a political unit and fairly respectfully um, basically how can you have a liberal democracy in which people differ quite radically over but in fact, explicitly religion, but also other things like issues about um, uh, the uh, nature of gender or uh, uh, what gender justice would look like and things like that. Well, gender justice, you might actually, since that's a political issue, you, you might think we have to resolve. But people have very different attitudes about sexuality, about religion, about morality. How can they nevertheless come together and uh, in full faith, endorse one another's conception of politics. And what that requires in Rawls's case is a stripping down of what we demand of one another politically um, so that we have very explicitly a kind of minimal area, he doesn't call it of enlightenment, of, of reasonableness that, that enables us to work together. And in the case of Habermas, it's a stripping down of the content of what we need to believe in order to be reasonable so that we can have a reasonable, we could have what I would call enlightened discourse across the board. So I think that um, sometimes quite literally in terms of their turning back to these essays of Kant, and certainly in the spirit of what they're writing, Habermas and Rawls represent very well um, a return to, or a maybe for the first time, a full turn to the minimalist strand of Kantian enlightenment. Um, and there are a lot of people who have had similar projects, so Nora O'Neill, for instance, who we mentioned before, um, my colleague, Tony Layden, who has a wonderful book on reasoning, um, and other Habermasians and colleagues of Habermas, like Axel Honneth or Albrecht uh, Velma, they all have a notion that we, the job of philosophy, the job of reflective people who are thinking about what everyone ought to believe, is in fact not to come up with one set of beliefs or to help us reach one set of beliefs, especially on some of the most important issues for, uh, for, for human life about uh, comprehensive views of what how to live on issues like whether to be an atheist or a theist, but in, instead to come up with terms by which we can respect one another in our differences. Um, and that seems to me very much a turn to the minimalist enlightenment. Um, there's still an insistence on being reasonable, which I think, well, it's Kantian, but I would also endorse it myself. It's not just everybody spouts whatever they feel like spouting. Um, and everybody relies on, I don't know, mystical visions or whatever authorities they happen to find on the web, uh, we do need some way of discussing our differences. And we need reasons by which to evaluate them for our own purposes and to get along with one another. And all of that is very Kantian, um, but it fits within the minimalist strand of Kantian enlightenment, I think, and I think that's all to the good. Yeah, and there's lots more to, to say about this, but maybe uh, like uh, still sort of moving on a little bit, right? Like you, uh, towards the end of your book, start to develop also your view, right, of sort of this minimalist strand. Um, so maybe you could sort of, I guess, like contrast it with like what Habermas and Rawls are saying and then how you flesh out sort of your version of the minimalist strand that you think is sort of worth wanting. So... Let me just say a little about this. I don't think I can go into it in too much detail. But I differ with one major aspect of the Habermasian project and one major aspect of the Rawlsian project, let's say. Although I, I, I'm i somewhat eclectic, I like to take on little Habermas, little Rawls, little Foucault. And as you'll hear in a moment, I actually have systematic reasons for being eclectic in this respect. Um, 
Habermas insists too much, I think, that we all need to get beyond the subject-object distinction, beyond foundationalist philosophy, uh, beyond metaphysics, in order to participate in this reasonable discourse or to recognize the reasonableness of its terms uh, that he's proposing. And I think that itself is already too much of a demand. Um, I am not fully convinced of his uh, uh, deconstruction, if you will, his, uh, uh, his, his rejection of the, of this, of the subject object distinction. Uh, I'm not a foundationalist myself, but I think there's more to it than he seems to grant. But in any case, I think it would be a, a very much the wrong sort of limitation on discourse, indeed some a, a kind of limitation that would restrict the reasonable discourse Habermas himself wants far more than I think he recognizes if we insisted that everyone has to accept his views of metaphysics and epistemology. Uh, including his anti-foundationalism and his rejection of the subject-object distinction in order to be a participant in reasonable discourse. Um, so I don't like his philosophical grounding for the rules for reasonable discourse he comes up with. I like the rules. I'm, I don't know that rules alone will do, but I think he comes up with some pretty good rules. But I don't think that we have to accept his elaborate philosophical grounding for his position. In the case of Rawls, um, I think his terms for public reason are too restricted to politics. I think he's right that we need this sort of limited notion of public reason, a module which is somewhat independent of our comprehensive conceptions of the good life if we are to get along politically. I, I, I am a political liberal. I share his political views that way. But it's not, maybe it's not so much that I reject something that he says here, but I am interested in terms of reasonable discourse that go way beyond the political. And here I think Rawls doesn't do enough, among other things, to recognize the importance of uh, what Hegel would call civil society. He's talking too much about our relationship to the state, and he hasn't thought enough, somewhat surprisingly hasn't thought enough about our relationship to our churches, our clubs, our um, voluntary organizations, and the kind of discourse that takes place there, because some of the same issues arise. We come even into those organizations with different comprehensive conceptions of the good or different ideas of how the organization ought to change. And here I think Kant himself is actually more sensitive than Rawls to the nature of our embeddedness in the social realm. That is to say, Kant's emphasis in, in what is enlightenment is not so much on what the state should do, but on the need for churches to be willing to change their doctrines. And I think not just churches, but all kinds of organizations, political parties, universities, and so forth, need to change their conception of themselves. And that they then have to work out what counts as reasonable discourse within the organization. What are the terms for that kind of discourse? And once again, anything goes isn't going to work. You can't just appeal to anything. I mean, there you get the kinds of pretty horrific debates that we have today between the COVID deniers and, and those who follow actual public health guidance, between those in America who deny that a legitimate election is taking place when every independent expert has said that it did. Um, we need to have some limitation on what counts as reasonable discourse. Moreover, within any, even what we call private organization, there's a uh, distinction between those who are loyal to the organization and those who are not, those who are members and those who are not. But then there's a question about whether loyalty entails accepting all the doctrines, dogmas, as you might call it, practices of that institution, or whether, on the other hand, um, it's essential to the institution to criticize those doctrines. Well, that's a question that comes up in all kinds of different forms. What you know, are you have you abandoned the university if you think that we if you have a radically different conception of what scholarship should be in this day and age? Uh, maybe you have some people I think who who want to throw out the Western canon. For me, that is abandoning the conception of the university as I see it. Uh, but on the other hand, 
some of those very same people might legitimately say, well, I'm just upholding a stodgy and maybe racist and sexist conception of the canon and so forth. Um, which is to say that the problems about how to reason across radically different conceptions of what your goals are, they arise within private organizations as well as in the, public, the larger state realm. And Habermas is better about talking about reasonable discourse across the board than Rawls is. So on the one hand, I like Rawls's conception of political reasoning, but I think it's too limited. And on the other hand, I like Habermas's conception of reasoning per se, but I think it's too grounded in a very specific kind of philosophy. And at the end of the book, one of the things that I argue, first of all, against Habermas is the defense of enlightenment, which in the minimalist sense, in which it's basically simply a condition for being able to participate in reasonable discourse at all. A, I want to keep it the enlightenment in that very minimal form, which really doesn't consist in much more than thinking for yourself and trying to think in terms that you think any rational person would accept, at least on the meta level again. But B, I don't think you can defend the importance of that kind of enlightenment on a philosophical basis alone, certainly not any single one. We need an eclectic defense and we need a defense of it in terms of the various communities we're approaching who may not accept that idea. Um, so I basically returning to the form of Kant's defense of what enlightenment, which is precisely a loose popular arg argument in a popular journal. I think that's the right way to think of defending enlightenment. We have to defend the importance of enlightenment, meaning here in the broader sense, reasonable discourse, as opposed to dogmatic discourse, as opposed to a refusal to think, as opposed to a thinking that um, relies on completely ridiculous sources instead of really trying to uh, be grounded in reasoning. We need to defend that conception of discourse in as broad terms as possible. That means in many different ways, hence eclectically, and also in ways that do not depend on any particular kind of philosophy. So that's one of the main things that I wanted to contribute in this book. I have to say the other main thing, which is even more important now than it was when I wrote it in 2012, I came out in 2013, but I finished it basically by 2012, is I wanted to stress the other I wanted to stress that Kant has two rules here, not just one. On the one hand, you have to think for yourself. On the other, as I said a lot during this interview, you have to think in generally reasonable terms, which means giving reasons that you think anyone could accept rather than just people who've had your particular experience or rather than appealing to what you feel is right. I'm pretty horrified by the fact that many people today just say, I feel when they mean I think. Um, just part of common discourse. I feel this, I feel that, instead of this is what I believe and here's why. And when you look at the horrific breakdown, I would say, of enlightenment, especially in America, but really across the Western world over COVID and over basic facts, like the facts of the 2020 election, I think it's even more important than before that we not simply say, think for yourself. All these people who deny the facts of the 2020 election or the facts of COVID, they would say they are thinking for themselves. And often they're mouthing what they've read on Google and some obscure and somewhat crazy TV site. But they'd say, yeah, I chose that. This is my belief. And that's not enough. That's certainly not enough to be enlightened. We also need a conception of responsible thinking. That's the term I use. It has to be vague. There's no way of pinning that down exactly. But a, reason, a reasoning that is responsible to some fairly robust conception of good reasons that looks for at least minimally, we can say, reasons that other rational beings should accept and is open to critique in those terms by uh, reasons from other rational beings, which means an appeal to broad facts of experience, to science, uh, to general principles of logic, to the kinds of critiques that 
enable us to say, this is a good authority, that's a bad authority. Um, this is all very vague, but, and I don't think enough philosophers have put enough work into trying to figure out exactly what responsible reasoning of that kind looks like. But I do think that's an important, it's an essential part of enlightened thinking. And it is something that Kant is at least gesturing towards. And I think it's something that we need to recapture. Yeah, and, and one thought um, uh, that, that, that comes to mind here, I, I'm not sure if you have a, a comment on this, would be like maybe returning back to like, you know, how to think and what to think, right? In some sense, but I might be misinterpreting here, right? Like by pressing the fact, right, that there are lots of facts, scientific facts, right, that are not debatable, right? They are sort of micro facts about what to think, right? That those micro facts should be incorporated into a view about how to think. So sort of like what I'm saying is there might be a version where like, because, you know, in some sense, science becomes so prominent, right? And there are sort of elementary facts that just play such a big role that there's just no way that we might have to say in this specific domain, I mean, this might be pushing sort of like a, a, a pro uh, a science points in sort of an enlightenment form, which is like, no, what to think at that front, at the micro level is really undebatable. I'm not sure if you think that that's taking it too far, but like that's sort of like what it feels like to me that like, I'm not sure if like it at least gives this struggle that like, yes, you, you don't want to have certain elementary facts up for debate, right? Like that should be the common ground, like how to think about that in many different ways and how to deal with that is a completely different question maybe where there might be again, a broader range of uh, opinions uh, or, you know, discussions that are uh, at play. But so, I mean, maybe to <laughs> phrase it in one sentence would be like, might science in, for example, these circumstances not push us to a very sort of maximalist trend of at least accepting this grouping of what to think facts that are simply unavoidable. That's sort of my, my thought. I think that I'm sympathetic to your worry, quite sympathetic to it, but I would put it in different terms. On one level, I want to say everything's debatable. Certainly every scientific fact is debatable. That's the whole idea. It's defeasible, right? Um, scientific claims are contingent claims, the empirical claims. There could be new information that would lead us to overturn even things we thought were very, very well settled. Moreover, the relevance of almost any particular fact can be questioned when it's put in the context of, well, how important is this fact to appreciating the beauty of a novel, to my religious views, to a metaphysical view, right? Um, in the face of many facts that might lead you to think we really are our brains, there's still people who defend free will, and I'm sympathetic to them, because they don't think that those facts about what we're like biologically are relevant to the question. And that's always open. Um, so in that sense, I don't want to say, well, there's a list of facts here that's not debatable. I do want to say, and this came up, I think, in what you said just now, that in certain domains, certain conversations, many factual claims need to be offline. They need to be taken for granted. And that's, in fact, something that people often don't understand, because in principle, from a religious or aesthetic perspective or metaphysical perspective, I might question the relevance of a certain scientific claim or because in principle, someday we might have evidence to overturn a scientific claim doesn't mean that it is up for debate right now, right? Um, moreover, and this is what I'm really sympathetic to, Kant makes it look in what is enlightenment. We didn't talk about this much and I'm gonna to have to go in a minute, so we won't get a chance to right now. Uh, but it makes it look as if you think for yourself and ignore all authorities. And we know from else place in his, uh, elsewhere in his writings, and uh, there are people have written about this very nicely, that Kant had a lot of respect for relying on authority for, for instance, facts of history. And he recognized the need for what today in epistemology is called testimony. Um, he didn't think through, and even today's thinkers about philosophers of testimony don't, I don't know if anybody's really thought this through very well. And think about the criteria that distinguish a good from a bad authority. And that's something that really concerns me. Because I think in a reasonable debate, there's a recognition, not necessarily that any particular fact has to stand fast, but that the two people debating at least are in no position to question the judgments of Stephen Hawking on black holes, of um, 
Anthony Fauci on COVID. <laughs> um, uh, you know, of Gordon Wood on the American Revolution, right? Um, or if they are in the position to question them, it's because you have an equally respectable, responsible, thoughtful uh, authority who says something different and you know enough about the issue that you can debate the difference between them. And I think that's gone missing. It's as if we live too much in the world of kind of think for yourself and not enough in the world of his think responsibly, where that has to include think responsibly about your authorities, but that means also accepting them on many issues. It is not a mark of responsible thinking right now if I substitute my judgment for Anthony Fauci's about COVID, given that I know nothing or next to nothing about the medical issues involved. If Anthony Fauci has some view about Kant's history, I can throw him aside. I think I know more about that, right? Uh, about, or about Adam Smith or something like that. But on many issues, certain issues, many, many issues, a mark of responsible thinking is knowing how to find good authorities and being willing to rely on them. And that's actually a whole, opens up a whole nest of issues that I don't think actually has been adequately discussed and is particularly important these days. I think we should end on that note so everyone can start thinking about uh, uh, those issues. But uh, uh, Professor uh, Fleischacker, uh, again, I really appreciate uh, your time in this conversation. So yeah, thank you so much.